Hey everybody, thanks for taking the time to listen to the Real Talk podcast. We hope that these discussions will inform and inspire you to engage in your own Real Talk. Today's episode is brought to you by our official sponsor, Trivan. Builders of custom trucks, trailers, and enclosure buildings tailored to your needs. Be sure to check them out at www.trivan.com. A big thanks to them for making these conversations possible. Now, on to the episode. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Real Talk Podcast. Today we have a couple of guests on, uh, it's going to be a good conversation about CanRC and URC relations and the history of the, the CanRef Church and the URC Church. And um, this is one that we've, I think was on our original list of podcasts that we wanted mm-hmm. to do from the very beginning. And we're finally getting around to it. So um, we have some great guests on. We have Reverend Wynia, um, who is a pastor of Lincoln Canadian Reformed Church, mm-hmm. previously preached in the CRC and in the URC. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but we'll hear more about that. And also Reverend Sweats from the Rayboth um, URC Church in Hamilton here too. So um, maybe we'll give you gentlemen a minute to introduce yourselves and a bit of, a, a bit of your background and what you know your work is now and, and also how you relate to this whole debate or uh, unity conversation. Yeah, okay. we'll start with Reverend Wayne. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church. I was born and raised in St. Catharines, not too far from where we are now. Um, I did, uh, I, I'll say now that I'm married to Charlene, and we have eight children and a bunch of grandchildren. Um, I entered the ministry in 1987. I had graduated from the uh, Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, and then spent a year at Calvin. And so in 1987, uh, we took a call to Aylmer CRC, and we were there about three and a half years. Uh, Then we had a call to Calgary, to a CRC in Calgary, and we were there about a year and a half uh, before that church divided, and we became independent for a few years, uh, probably less than a few years, a couple of years. And then uh, when the URC formed, we were one of the original congregations. I served, uh, after the church in Calgary, we moved to uh, Wyoming, Ontario, served a URC there for 10 years. And then in 2008, we uh, received a call to the Vineyard Canadian Reformed Church in Lincoln, and we've been there since. So almost uh, 14 years by now. Oh, wow. Full 14. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. Reverend Swartz. Yeah. So I am an American serving in Canada. This is my second church. I was in Abbotsford, BC for seven, eight years. And then we moved here in 2016. So we've been here, yeah, six, um, almost seven years. I'm married to Rachel. We have four children, two boys, two girls. Our oldest just started high school. So that's a new chapter in our life. Wow. (laughs) Kind of a fearful chapter in our life. Yeah. Um, So I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church as well in South Chicago area. And that church continued until I was, I think, about 14 years old, maybe 15, 14, 15, somewhere around there. And then it split. And this was right when the URC was starting. So that congregation I was in um, divided 60%, 40%, 60% stayed CRC, 40% left. And so, yeah, we had this, this split happen right in my teenage years. And it's kind of a unique time in my life, but when a split happens as a, as a young person, you kind of ask a lot of questions about it. Mm-hmm. And in the long run, I think God used it in, in those mm-hmm. formative years um, for good. So yeah, it was URC, went to uh, Calvin College, went to Mid-America Reform Seminary, graduated in 07. And yeah, in my second church now, both URCs. I've had a few calls to Canadian Reform churches, um, but still in the URC. So I love the Canadian Reformed and I feel a true unity with them. And so I'm excited about this conversation we're going to have today. Awesome. Is it pretty common that uh, when that split happened, that the churches would divide um, within the congregation and not have a whole congregation uh, separate off? So what happened was some totally left, some divided. So the church that I'm pastor of now is one another one that divided. Okay. Other churches, the whole church left wholesale. Right. In my experience, when a church divides, it's only half leaves or percentage leaves. Those are really people are really the fighters. 
and right. it's probably going to have a bit more of a conservative feel to it. Right. When the whole church leaves and you leave both sides. Mm-hmm. Right, so essentially, right. if a church splits over theological reasons, yeah. you take out a whole voice from the church, and what you leave behind is the voice you disagree with. But it goes mm-hmm. very quickly in that direction then. Right. So sense. for those churches that, that split, like the church that I was from, um, you know, it was probably 600 people in that church. And now it's, they might have 250 members, but probably 30 people in the second service now back in the CRC. Right. Wow. Where's the church that I'm from then, the URC, has 400 members, but still 300 in the afternoon or something. Right. Like that. So, yeah. right. Healthy. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I guess on an individual basis, then everyone has to kind of make that decision for themselves and not mm-hmm. have the, you know, just relying on the church to make it for them, right? And in that, so, you know, it's the point of our discussion, but interesting, that church had 12 elders, 12 deacons that I grew up in, 21 of the 24 office bearers resigned. Wow. So they were only left with three office bearers and a minister. The minister stayed CRC. Wow. But I think some of the office bearers that resigned thought he was going to come to URC and didn't. Mm-hmm. So... But you take your whole leadership out of a church then. Yeah. Um, wow. So made a lot of people angry for a long time, including, yeah, my, gran- including my grandparents who stayed back in the CRC. <laughs> oh, <yeah. clears throat> wow. That, wow. It's, okay. Yeah. So maybe let's start like we should go through the history way back when because mm-hmm. we got like as young people, we don't. Again, I'm calling myself young. But nice. <laughs> yeah. If you're younger, as younger than Lucas, don't really think about these things. Like a lot of times we think about the the Canner C and URC. Um, similar to like what our, what our Christian schools would be, just like, yep, we're all, we're all the same, and um, you know, marry in, marry out, like that's a common occurrence, especially in the Hamilton uh, in Niagara region. Um, but let's go back to um, like when the Canref people came here um, from. Well, I guess it was a second wave of immigration, or um, like, what did they find? Like, what was the CRC like? And then let's kind of walk through that whole thing. I don't know who would take that. Well, I wasn't uh, alive when uh, most of them came. Uh, yeah, that's the young side of the table. This is the old side of the table. I get that, but uh, not quite that old. But uh, I would say probably most of the uh, liberated people from the Netherlands came around the same time as the others did, which would be mostly early 50s, 1950, early 50s, at least to Canada. Right. And uh, they would have found um, Christian Reformed congregations. Um, and uh, some of them joined Christian Reformed congregations in different parts of the country. Uh, at the same time, they joined them, but they wanted also for the Christian Reformed Church to recognize what had happened in Holland. Um, the CRC in uh, 1946, so this is before the immigration would have taken place, uh, most of it, um, was invited to send delegates to, uh, to a liberated synod. And they declined to do so, saying they didn't recognize the liberated churches. They only recognized the, what, what Canadian Reformed people call the synodical churches hmm. uh, in the Netherlands. Um, uh, Skilder came for a couple of preaching tours throughout, uh, speaking and preaching tours throughout North America. The first one, he was welcomed on, on Christian Reformed pulpits. The second one, the stated clerk of the CRC sent a, a letter out, or a, I think a note in the banner, the church magazine, uh, indicating that he was not to be admitted to pulpits because he did not belong to a sister church. Hmm. And so those are some things I think that uh, Canadian Reformed people uh, held against the CRC, hmm. um, but still some tried to start in the CRC. There was also a, a group that um, that united themselves with the Protestant Reformed churches, uh, but that fell apart soon after when uh, the Protestant Reformed churches uh, made an extra scriptural or extra confessional requirement. You had to think like a Protestant Reformed person, you, you know, um, to, to uh, be an office bearer and so forth. You had to sign a declaration of principles. Mm. So they uh, withdrew from that as well. Um, I think in St. Catharines, there was somebody who wanted uh, to have liberated minister sermons read. And that was not permitted by the consistory. So there were certain mm. incidents that uh, brought about, uh, uh, call it a movement, to start Canadian Reformed churches um, out west, first of all, and then shortly after out here, mm. if I understand correctly. Okay. Um, 
No, it's a good synopsis. I mean, yeah, just for anyone um, who doesn't know the history, there was a bit of a, um, like the CRC had come to North America much earlier, right? And there was a split in, within Holland, and that's right. what they wouldn't recognize with the liberation, right? Well, they were sister churches, and so the, the claim of the Canadian Reformed churches was, since you're sister churches, you have an obligation to investigate what happened mm-hmm. in your sister church in the Netherlands. Right. But they, they wouldn't do that. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. They tried so, not to take a side, but in doing so. They took a side. They took a yeah. side. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Although I just the, the Canadian Reformed churches on several occasions wrote letters to the CRC Synod appealing to them and asking them to sit down and talk. Mm-hmm. And and if could, they could find a way to be, you know, to to work toward reunion or union. Right. And yeah. that's over the course of a, multiple decades. As that's, well, right. Right? that's right. right. Yeah. That's right. And that effort continued. Yeah. Were there specific issues that uh, those members that started up the, the Canadian Reformed Churches identified that the CRC was, you know, off base on? Or was it more the denominational um, kind of tension? I think confessionally, they wouldn't have been identical, but they would not have been far apart from each other at that point. I mean, it was soon after the liberation, and the divergence wasn't wasn't that great at that point. Um, I don't think there were certainly not doctrinal things that I can think of or that that I've you know recognized or remember. Um, even church politically, there would have been differences, but uh, apparently not. Those were not in themselves insurmountable. Right. Um, it was, I think, I think the main point was recognition of interaction with uh, those churches, the liberated churches in Holland. Mm, that, yeah. I, th- I think that kind of right. captures what the, what the big thing was. Gotcha. Right. So then over time, the CRC is generally shifting away from um, biblical principles. And this leads into when the URC becomes a federation. This is sometime in the 90s. I don't know exactly when. So could you fill us in on the whole history of that? Sure. Sure. So what happened in the CRC then, as as time progressed, already in the 70s and 80s, there were some wrong teaching taking place. The the, the Christian Reformed Church has its own seminary and college. So Mm -hmm. Calvin College is a college of the, um, or Calvin University now it's called, is a university of the CRC. Mm. So there was things taking place at Calvin College that, that the conservatives in the CRC were disagreeing with, such as theistic evolution being taught. Um, So this is already taking place in the 80s. And so some of these issues were kind of boiling up and the CRC was not dealing with them. They weren't disciplining these professors. They were letting these things go. So already in the early 70s, some people had left the CRC and started something called the Orthodox Christian Reformed Church, OCRC, which doesn't even exist anymore. Hmm. Whereas the last congregation, I think, is... um, out Cambridge way. Yeah. It's the only one that hasn't one. affiliated. Um, anyway, and I know they're talking about affiliation. Maybe they even have now, hmm. but, oh, um, cool. Interesting. but I think they were going ARP is last I heard. Anyway. So already in the early seventies, people are, people are leaving the CRC and in the eighties, it kind of continued, but in the early nineties is when it really started to hit in the early nineties, the CRC opened up the office of Deacon to women. And so a lot, especially in Canada, especially in Niagara area, a lot of churches were already starting to leave, 91, 92, 93. And they kind of had a loose alliance together. These were independent churches now, but they had a, a, an alliance together. And they, they would meet every year and, and kind of talk about the future and, right. and what are they going to do. Then it really came to a head in 95 when the CRC opened up all, um, all the offices to women. Mm. So... There was issues of theistic evolution, women in office, um, practicing homosexuals in good standing in the church. There was a lot of periphery issues, but really what it came down to is the scriptures. Mm. The way that they argued for these things, Paul says this about homosexuality then, Paul says this about women then, and it's just reserved for the Corinthians or it's reserved for the Ephesian church. So Mm. they limited the scriptures to that culture. Mm -hmm. And what happened was you start to undermine then the authority of scriptures. The, the Bible does not actually say what it means. It doesn't say that to us. Right. And so when you have that, now all of a sudden you've, you've kind of knocked the foundation out of the authority of scripture. And mm-hmm. I'd say that is the real reason why these churches left the CRC. And then in 96, um, they formed together um, to start the URC. And yeah, ever since then they've, they've come. 
At this point, the, right. the URC is two thirds in the U.S., one third in Canada. Okay. And that nucleus was like started in Niagara and then spread across the country. The early, or? the church that left kind of earlier were, were Niagara, yeah. but ninety six is probably the way it's divided up now. Okay. Um, right. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. So Iowa, Chicago, Grand Rapids. Yep. Um, California. Yeah. yeah. Lots of California churches came a couple years later. Okay. Niagara. Yeah. yeah. Calgary. One in BC, maybe. Yeah. The majority of churches were Canadian churches when it, when the Federation formed. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That's so that switched. Yeah. When Once it was formed, it seemed like a number of churches said, okay, now we got somewhere to go. Yeah. We're not just going to be independent. So they wanted right. to move into a, fed that's my sense that they wanted to move into a Federation. Okay. Hmm. Some of these theological issues, though, uh, even like if you, um, Right now you have the Outlook magazine. There was one called The Torch and Trumpet before. Okay. And they were already the uh, Association of Christian Reformed Laymen. There was that were, you know, identifying certain issues in the CRC, probably in the 60s already. Mm. And uh, 1972, there was the report on scriptural authority. And uh, and there were issues with that. So there were, and, and there were a couple of professors at, uh, well, one professor at Calvin Seminary, Harold Decker, the love of God controversy. He, he was uh, he was characterized an Arminian in his view of the love of God for all people. Uh, Harry Boer was a missionary in Nigeria, and he had uh, issues with reprobation. He believed that uh, only people who had heard the gospel and rejected Christ would be lost. He said that's really what reprobation is. So not that he succeeded, but there were these significant mm. doctrinal issues that you know started to arise. Right. And uh, yeah, I had just entered the ministry in 1987. And I think it was 1990 that the Synod, they call it the Synod of Dort because they met at Dort College, mm. actually. And they examined Howard Van Til, mm. who was a professor at Calvin College. And he had written a book called The Fourth Day, and he had a, a very liberal hermeneutic. So he was a, he was a, he taught physics. He was an astronomist, but he, made remarks about biblical interpretation, uh, which were, and the synod examined him and said he's, you know, he's within the bounds. Hmm. So this was, like, like you said, scriptural authority was really the, the main Driving issue. force. Yeah, there was bureaucracy, there were the quotas, there was a, a home mission, there were missions, uh, issues with home missions to some extent, but the, the core of it was certainly, you know, the, the authority of scripture. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So did the churches who divided and, and split left, did, do they identify like, um, yeah, I guess like the particular things, um, are those still things that they struggle with now? Like, is that divide still the same? Um, when you look at those two denominations that you are seeing the CRC or are, or have, have the CRC drifted more, the URC, you know, cleaned up their theology even more? Or? I think the URC is uh, like, they, you wouldn't want to talk about women's ordination in, this, in the URC. Like, you you know, you wouldn't get very far if that right. was your, uh, if that was your uh, interest. Um, they struggled a little bit. I, th I would say I was at a synod when we talked about uh, uh, theistic evolution. Not that, not that they tolerate theistic evolution, not at all. I don't mean to suggest that. But you had some people who held to the framework hypothesis and settling on a, a statement about creation seemed mm. to be a difficult thing. Right. Um, but I do not doubt the orthodoxy of the URC on that point. That's not, not at all what I want to suggest. Um, URC, I mean, they've, they've kept the line, you know. Uh, the CRC mm. is hard for me to say how, how much the CRC has changed. I'm just not seen at all, yeah. Have you no, observed it I, more yourself? Yeah, well, I think the CRC has continued to drift. It, the CRC continues to decline in membership. Mm. By the year 2000, they had hoped to have 400,000 members. Now in 2022, I think they're at 240,000. Oh, wow. So wow. they were well over 300,000 for a while, and they, they keep losing people. And I think they will keep losing people. I think whenever churches give up on orthodoxy, commitment to the scripture, you're going to lose. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is true. Or you get to the point where you become just theologically liberal and you don't, you don't even believe in the core doctrines. They're not at that point yet. Right. Um, they're still, it's still a confessional reformed church. They just, yeah. Right. Gotcha. So, but this past synod for the CRC had a couple positive things. That's true. Yeah. In Grand Rapids, there's a, 
a lesbian woman who's married to a woman um, who was ordained as an elder and the CRC synod um, decided to reprimand that church and said that that's unacceptable. So that was good. Yeah. Right. They took a good stand on which which on, part of that did they say was unacceptable? That she's an office bearer, I think. Oh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Because they allow both ends of it, but not uh No, you're gonna talk about the report they adopted on uh, homosexuality. I was gonna say that next, yeah. But yeah. They adopted a, a they, they kind of are towing the line on LGBTQ issues. Right. Which is good to see, but very divisive in the in the CRC. Right. And I'm yeah. not sure what's going to happen. Um, yeah. We, we talked about that a bit about uh, when we talked about Redeemer, because um, mm. that's heavily influenced from the, from the CRC too. Yeah. I'm just curious about that. Like um, just in the, in the minds of someone, cause I mean, we're both from uh, Canref backgrounds, but um, in our minds, like when we, when we think about certain issues, we come at it from a historically, like from a perspective that we were taught from our, parents and grandparents but i don't know of like how a person my age would even think in the urc about certain issues and what what would be the um kind of their focus if they were looking at a, a church um to see if it was a true church or not like and they and just hearing this is thinking like okay well the authority of scripture that to me doesn't even enter my mind necessarily right away but is that uh are there other things that would be I guess commonly thought of in the URC as something that to keep an eye out for. Yeah, I think another aspect of that is church discipline. The CRC just wasn't exercising church discipline, mm. at least not across the board. There, there were some CRCs that were very faithful in these things, so it's hard to categorize the whole right, denomination right. this yeah. way. And still, there's some very um, orthodox CRCs um, that are still around, especially in the Midwest, U.S. Um, but church discipline is one. Um, for instance, this this woman who's a who's married to a woman is a member of good standing of a church. She's an elder, but she's also a member of good standing in a church. Yeah, she's living in a, mm -hmm. a in a relationship that is contrary to the seventh commandment. Yep. But she's not under discipline. That type of thing. Right. Yep. It's like okay. Yeah. You have to. We confess that is one of the three marks of a true church. Mm -hmm. So if a church is not doing that, what conclusion would you come to? Except that it's not a true church. Right. Yep. This is not certainly being faithful to the calling of a true church. Mm. Gotcha. Okay. I want to get back to the history of this. So when um, the URC gets formed in the 90s, and now I, I just found this out, the majority of it was in Canada at first. What uh, was preventing uh, those members leaving the CRC and forming the URC from talking to the Canadian Reformed Churches and possibly joining them? Did that discussion happen originally? And what did that result in? Um, Maybe Reverend Sweat, so we'll go over money on that. Yeah. So my understanding of this has been come down from ministers like Reverend Wynia and <laughs> Reverend Bowers, who were actually there. Gotcha. But um, so I think what happened was there's recognition that the URC needed to be established and figure out who they are, who who's with us. Right. How many congregations do we have here? Are we talking 30? Are we talking a hundred? Where are these congregations? Yep. Is there any familiarity whatsoever with the Canadian Forum? In the in the U.S., there's not. No. So mm -hmm. that's fair. It's um, it might have been major. Within three years, I would say probably of the URC starting, it had become majority U.S. type mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was a whole there was a whole, whole conservative pockets in in Canada, right. such mm -hmm. as the Niagara region, right? And um, so the. So the advice that, that I've been told, talking with the Canadian Reform, then kind of at our early synods, even before the synod happened, there were there was these alliance meetings, okay, kind of pre pre synodical type meetings of groups that might church that might want to leave, yep. And um, the advice from the Canadian Reform brothers that came, I think, like Dr. DeYoung and Dr. Van Dam, was to get yourself established, and then. We'll, have, we'll send representatives and you can meet with your representatives. We'll figure out a way forward gotcha. how we can become one. That makes mm. sense. So, so the, the advice was to become your own federation first and then would be we'll work from that. Oh, interesting. What, was, that, was that your experience? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the <clears throat> so that we had what they called a consistorial conferences first. And the, okay. it kind of functioned like a, a synod. 
Okay. You had delegates and these kinds of things, but it was not an ecclesiastical assembly, strictly speaking. Then it developed into the uh, Christian Reformed Alliance, I think. And then it was called the Alliance of Reformed Churches. As a matter of fact, the Owen Sound Canadian Reformed Church was a member of the Alliance of Reformed Churches. That's why we changed the name, because they joined. Because it was not an alternate denomination. So they said, well, and and uh, the Canadian Reformed, quite a number, quite a list. Like uh, My memory is something like 17 different denominations or federations would send observers to our uh, alliance or uh, those kinds of meetings. Mm. Oh, wow. And when we talked about federating, we actually sent a letter to all those groups yep. and said, what should we do? Do we join you or do we start on our own? And right. every, everyone told us to start on our own. Uh, yeah. It was supposed to be provisional from the Canadian Reformed side. I think they wanted a, a provisional federation. Um, but okay, that was the advice. Personally, I had the same experience in Calgary. Uh, Dr. Faber, you probably heard his name, even though you don't uh, know him, um, was one of my professors then at the seminary. And I remember as a pastor in Calgary saying, what do I, what do I advise my congregation to do? You know, mm. there's the true church. There's a congregation in Calgary. Should we start a new church? Or should I say to them, you're obliged to go there? And he said, no, you, uh, you should, you know, you have to be the shepherd of the sheep. You hold them together. Mm -hmm. If you say to them, go to the Canadian, they will scatter. Mm -hmm. And this way you hold them together. Right. I got into a bit of, uh, there was a couple from Nearlandia who had written me a letter uh, earlier and said, you know, we're, we're, whatever, we want to leave the CRC, but nothing is happening in Nearlandia. I said, well, there's a Canadian Reformed Church there. You should join the Canadian Reformed Church. So they did. And then when we didn't <laughs> join the Canadian Reformed Church, <laughs> I got another letter. Uh, what's up with that? So I'm not sure they bought my uh, rationale or Dr. Faber's rationale, but anyway, so it was an issue. Yeah. You know, where do we go? Do we do we start something new? Do we join together? It was more of an issue for Canadian churches, I think. Right. right. I don't think it was really on the, American on the agenda for the American. Yeah. The American they didn't have that, nope. that near fellowship already. I guess. So. Do you think that was a mistake now in hindsight, just because of all the issues there has been, like the yeah. the trouble it's been to unify? Very hard to say. You know, would we have scattered right. the people if we had been premature as well, it was? Yeah. How different were the traditions then? Like, so right now we have. I mean, we'll get into this stuff too, but we have different psalm books. We have different. Um, like the worship's not exactly the same. Our, our liturgy's not exactly the same. Um, how I can only imagine the CRC was quite different than, mm. um, is it, was that kind of a consideration? Like if we send people to this new church, weird church, don't have a hundred, you know, 300, 400, 500, 600 Psalms song. <laughs> well, at that time, you probably had a, a mixture of, of issues that you would have been up against. So you mm. would have had members who remembered the liberation. Right, and you know enough to know that that was a bitter mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So and to so accept the, some CRC people into your church, like yeah, yeah, and and that. vice versa for the people who who were whatever. I mean, they had their conflicts, right? Certainly in the Netherlands and to some degree in Canada. Sure, and and they remembered, mm. and uh, to to overcome that, uh, a number of people have told me whenever a URC consistory would sit down with a Canadian Reform consistory, because there were a lot of those kinds of meetings. Uh, one of their first questions would always be, do you consider us a true church? Mm. Because that was the issue, right? Yep. We're the true church. At least that was the, right. the going understanding for the Canadian Reformed. Yep. Uh, and uh, and that's a chip on the shoulder of the others. You don't think we're the true church, so that's what we got to clear up first. Gotcha. Mm. Yeah. But the right. Canarsie answer seemed always to be the same. We wouldn't talk to you if we didn't think you were true right. churches. So mm. I think... Uh, I think there was a lot of personal issues, and the pastors and leadership knew this, that the Canadian Reformed Church of 25 years ago is very different than it is today. Right. They were very insular, and in some ways, it, exclusive. Right. Like, stories I've heard, when, when things are going awry in the CRC, even, even locally reaching out to the Canadian Reform, let's say 25 years ago, I want to leave the CRC and become independent or whatever. Can I send my kids to Guido? No, you cannot send your kids to Guido. Right. Mm -hmm. So they see this type of stuff or can inform people saying, 
you're part of the CRC, you are part of a false church. Mm. Some places, and especially the a couple of U.S. areas, that was a huge issue. Right. right. And as soon as we will, as soon as my synod recognizes you, then you're part of a true church. Right. That's not how true and false churches work. Mm. I don't care if you recognize us or not. Your our your recognition of me does not make me true or false. Before, right. In, right. Yeah. So yeah. that type of thing, a Did little that, a little emphasis, different yeah. emphasis on church. That was that was big. And then even from, um, yeah, old old ties, and in in the Canadian form, yeah, mm. they were they kind of stuck together, and they didn't they didn't mix in well with the rest of the reformed world. Maybe in business, right? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and, like, and and so you think, why would that be a theological issue? To me, coming in now, it's not a theological issue whatsoever. But to people who went through it, it is. They got long right. memory. Yeah, yeah. Is that just? Does that just come out of that not finding a home when you get here kind of attitude? Like you you go to the CRC, disagree with them, start on our own, start our own schools, start our own communities. Like, yeah, I, I agree. It's like kind of an insulated kind of, you know, inward sort of exclusionary attitude. It was, uh, it was, yeah. there's no doubt, you know, but I, I remember asking my father, you know, what about this only one true church thing? And he lived as a late, in his late teens through the liberation. Mm. As a matter of fact, your dad's grandfather and my grand, my grandfather are half brothers and each went a different direction. And uh, so, the, the, you know, he remembered mm. those those things. And he said already before the liberation, being the true church was a huge issue in, in a Hrefmira Kerkin, the, the Reformed Church in the Netherlands. So you could about imagine when you, when you divide, now which one of us is it, mm-hmm. right? And it became a huge, and, and, and that stuck in people's craw. So if you couldn't join, you couldn't send your kids to the school, you felt judged. Yeah. If if things happened in business, as you suggest, um, you know that that felt you felt judged. Yeah. That's that's what it that that was a big thing. Right. Yeah. If yeah. you don't let your children date somebody from that church, people remember that stuff. Yeah. If you call off a wedding because you're they're going to join the wrong of the two churches. People remember that stuff. Yeah. And it's hard to to work that, past that. Is that coming apart now, these days? Like, I think in most places. Um, you, yeah, but you, you still, you still meet once in a while. Yeah, an, an old school can refer who's you know two hundred percent can ref, and it's like okay, you're mm-hmm. still the only true church in town. So yeah, yeah, but I think their their voice is not loud. Right, they don't. They're not. They're not. Uh, hmm. They're not ministers anymore, and stuff like that. At least my in my mm-hmm. opinion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Reverend Mooney, you'll probably see the change happen more since he's he's closer to it. He's he, he's seen it for a longer period of time. Well, he's but. done the jump, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, my experience, <clears throat> excuse me, my experience has not been negative, really. Um, so it was 1982 that I went to the Canadian Reform Seminary, and they welcomed me. And I cannot remember any incident. There were a couple of little little things one uh, one fellow student said, "You got a good grade on your sermon because that professor likes Christian reformed people." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, but but I was well received by the professors, by the other students. You know, yeah. no issues at all. Yeah. Uh, my experiences have been pretty positive, but there have been some that were not. And uh, but but to some extent, I have to say it kind of cuts both ways. Um, it's different in the URC, but I've been very disappointed at different times, different occasions, with the slowness of the of the United Reform to to move in a direction, to be flexible with certain things. That I, I have thought that the Canadian Reform have been more flexible in this. Mm-hmm. My impression is it's got a lot to do with. I mean, I don't know how you guys grew up in that sense what did you what did you learn about church unity mm. you know for canadian reform people my impression is it's a no brainer true churches should join each other mm-hmm. yeah. like that that's abc yeah uh, christian reform people were not brought up that way i certainly wasn't right you know 
So the what I would call the ecumenical imperative, whatever, yeah. um, is much stronger. And that means the Canadian Reformed have been more aggressive also. And that almost, you know, that frightens Sets people off. Sets off alarm bells. Yeah. For <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like a pushy guy on a date. Yeah. Like, you right. know, hey, yeah, back yeah, yeah. off. We don't even know each other yet. Like, right. you know, so... Yeah. Right. Does that ring true to you? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, but I think the URC has definitely been slower, and thus this whole process has dragged out more from the URC side. Okay, but it's mm. it's mostly not only, but mostly from the American URC side. Mm-hmm. That's what I've heard. So, yeah. so if you, if you think about this for for a minute, about in the Netherlands, it's only Dutch people who live there. Yeah, and they they're Reformed or Roman Catholic or nothing. Um, in the U.S., it's all kinds. Yeah. So we have a close relationship with the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We love the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We love our OPC brothers and sisters. But we're not going to merge with them. They have a different confessional history than we do. How could you? How could we do that? Right. I think you actually could, but it's not. It's very difficult practically. Right. But you know what? We love each other. Well, let's work together. Sure. We're completely fine with that relationship. Yeah. Mm. We do not feel the need to to merge. But when you have these Dutchmen mm. that have come, um, the later immigrants. With, with this idea of there can only there there's there, there's a true church of Jesus Christ yeah. and there's other false churches of Jesus Christ and all true churches should seek the greatest possible visible unity they can in the face of the earth mm. um, and so there's the, there's this push and it's just like Reverend Money said for some URC people like back off man yeah. we have to we have our own issues we're trying to right. how much time are we going to spend talking about you are the Canadian formed and take away those resources, those people from doing the work of missions, mm-hmm. church planting. Yeah, mm. it is on an ecumenical committee. Maybe I spend in one year 150 hours. Is there a better way I could spend 150 hours than dealing with ecumenical? In some people's mind, yeah. yeah so, right. so it's a cultural, I mean, I'm on the committee, so cultural. I'm obviously in favor of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a cultural attitude, kind of mm-hmm. an American. Like mm-hmm. differences are okay. Like that's mm-hmm. fine. Versus. This you, Dutch you, mindset. You of, see it in the churches of, of Napark, which yeah. is the 13 um, federations that are part, part of Napark. Some have no desire in any way to ever merge with any other church. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The Reformed Church of the United States, I'd say, is probably one of them. At least a lot of the their representatives will say that. Wow, we're good. We don't need to talk about moving anything forward. Let's, let's talk about how our youth can get married to each other. Right. Like, okay. Um, you hold the Heidelberg Catechism. We probably make this work. Nope, not interested. So really, is that more, um, are those more liberal denominations? Mm. Not even it's just America. It's just a more of an more Americanized mindset. mindset I Cause think. yeah, that Americanized, like everyone in America says they're a Christian. And then there's like, you go to a town and you Google church and there's like 60 of them and they're all different. And they have like the, you know, everything from the Joel Olsteins to, you know, the URC. So like, yeah, I guess there's just a spectrum of like, you know, church shopping or whatever that, yeah, that's interesting that I just, you just don't see that here in Canada. It's totally, it's, it's totally a different. totally different situation. There's far more Christians. There's far more percentage wise Christians or far yeah. more percentage wise people go to church as a politician. It's to your advantage in the U S to be a Christian in Canada. It's a negative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a Protestant denomination in the U S that has half the population of Canada in their membership. Really? 15 so million people in the Southern Baptist convention, 14 million. I think I'm like, that's a big, they're all over the place. Yeah. That's um, crazy. A lot. So it's, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's okay. just a culturized culture thing. Cause it, in Canada, like we have, we're, we're very small federations yeah. of churches too. And they quickly disappear if they're not faithful yeah. or, or active or. Yeah. But even like, you know, the RCA, CRC, PCA, they think, okay, they're, they're kind of equal here, but PCA is 1500 churches. Right. CRC is still seven or 800 churches. RCA is still close to 900 churches. Year, 65 churches. We're 130 churches. Yeah. This is... Um, peanuts. peanuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in some of the denominations of Napark, like one has nine churches. Yeah. Another one has 22 churches. Right. Like, So small. that kind of leads into a question. Like we talk about diversity of like, so I'm, you know, moving to Calgary. When I went to visit Calgary Church, Calgary Church is the exact same church as like, you know, one of the, you know a few of them in here in in uh, in Niagara region. Like, when we go to church, like if you go to church in every Canadian Reformed church in Canada, I'm sure they're almost identical. 
in terms of the worship, even what you can expect when you walk through the door. Is that the same for the URC? Like maybe we talk about that like diversity and then maybe even all those other denominations. Is it- the U or the, the Canadian Reform will definitely have a greater degree of uniformity in their worship, partly because their synod has proposed two orders of worship. I right. think I think you're touching. No, they're not official. Okay. No, they're they're just, in the book though. Yeah, they're in the book, but they're not official. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's not an you, official document. The order of worship. It's it's not a. There's no synodical no decision saying that's what you have to do. Huh. So you, even if it's a guideline, yeah. everybody's yeah. got the same guideline yeah. then. So right. yeah, CRC used uh, yeah, you to be get like two that. options. Yeah. In, but in the in the URC, I think the worship itself probably is pretty close to uniform. You know, there's a few churches that will have something slightly different. Right. Um, especially now I, I see a movement in the second service has a bit of a different flavor. Right. I think some Canadian reform churches are moving that way. Mm-hmm. Canadian reform are also less uniform than they used to be. Yeah. That's um, true. And in that sense, the Canadian reform is becoming more progressive. Some of these churches are more progressive than any church in the URC. Right. In terms of their worship. <clears throat> right. Yeah, I don't so know. I've never heard of a URC that would have drums, for instance. Right. But there's Canadian reform that would. Um, so there's okay. So that that's that's a movement. That's not fine. But right. it <laughs> will <laughs> comment on that here. It will grow. Right. Right. Yeah. But is that but that movement in the CanRC, I think, is more driven by people recognizing um, you know, our worship style and then adjusting for that. In the URC, is the difference or any difference that there is, is that just natural? Is that or is that something that they have also taken note of or is it just kind of come down from the crc practices and turned into what it is i th- i think some some of that is true some of it is influence of other evangelical churches you know yeah. but some of the, the the crc in the in in the states there would be the phenomenon that's called special music so you'd have a soloist or you'd have a choir or something like that in the midst of the worship service that was much less true in canada Mm. Although the church I served in Calgary and the CRC, then the URC, had a choir in the worship service, but it was it was not what I grew up with at all. Mm. Um, and I think you'd see more of that. I don't know for sure, but I, I, I initially I had you know I preached in a lot of URCs actually almost across the country, and they would be almost identical right across the country. Okay, mm-hmm. um, how much that's changed is hard for me to say. It's probably true for both federations, though. Like, you're going to have a lot less homogeneity as we, you know, integrate into society yeah. further and further. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Do I we, was under the impression that it was more, the URC would have more diversity in their worship than the, than the CANRC but in, in terms of style. And yeah, culture. so I think the diversity is going to come from when a church is either church plant or they're non- right. Dutch Reformed people that have established this. Yeah, that makes good sense, yeah. So yeah. in the process of church planting, right, you have, it's thus of an ethnic feel of a church. Yeah. But a lot of our things that we love are pretty tied to our history of how we grew up. Right. But if you didn't grow up with it, then yeah. it's not mm. it's not a sacred cow to you, so right. fine. Yep. Um, yeah, so. that's fair. Yeah. Can we go back to the history a little more? Mm-hmm. So, um we're in the mid nineties. Now we're moving further. Um, a lot of these talks are taking place as towards unity between the URC and the CANRC. It seems that, uh, there's a lot of feet dragging on the American side of the things. Um, so where do those talks really break down and when do we last have any sort of serious discussions on, on unity? Cause there was a, like a, a fair amount of work put into this from what I understand. Um, Reverend Wynia, maybe. Yeah, it's a little bit hard for me to put a date on it, but I, Roughly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be, uh, like I was, the last URC Synod I was at was 2007, Shererville. And um, uh, I was on the the songbook committee and uh, that got stalled at that Synod, you would say. Strictly mm-hmm. speaking, you might just say, but reading the acts of the Synods, you would have said there was progress and there was, you know, but that Synod, in my mind, kind of stalled it. And, th- and that was a, a pretty big uh, signal, you know, that that the interest or whatever you want to call it, the drive is not there, you know. Um, I think when, was it 2001, I think, they be, we became sister churches. Yep. And um, and I feel like they put a bit of a timeline on it, as a matter of fact, initially. Mm-hmm. They said something like 2004, we'll join together. Some of the members of the Ecumenicity Committee were very aggressive also in their expectation. 
and um, and putting that timeline and saying 2004 spooked people mm. a little bit similar to what we talked about earlier and uh, made them more resistant. But in my experience, it would be the mid to like like 2005, 2007 in there somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. So what what kind of stalled it out a bit was that. Uh, in the years after this, in the couple of years after this, we had three joint committees, the URC, Canadian Reform, to, to figure out how you could actually merge two churches together. One dealt with the songbook, one dealt with theological education, and the other one then dealt with the church order. So the theological education committee was at an impasse. They just frankly disagreed. The URC does not want a federational seminary overseen by the synod. The Canadian mm-hmm. Reformed argues that that is actually biblically mandated of a, a, a school by the churches for the churches. Mm-hmm. We agree with the same principle by the church for the churches. We just disagree with how that's applied right. as a federation. Personally, I'm, I'm frankly in favor of a federational seminary myself, but it's not a huge issue. So that, so that was a problem. I think there is a way forward there, though. There still is a way forward there in that issue. Um. And the church order probably, I would say, was the biggest impediment to. There was a perception from the URC that the Canadian form is too hierarchical. Synod has too much authority. Synod says too much. Mm. And for instance, the songs that you sing mm-hmm. have to be approved by your synod. Yeah. Whereas our church order would say, no, the, all the entirety of the worship is overseen by the consistory. Consistory will approve songs. You have to have two worship services on a Sunday, preach from the confessions ordinarily, weekly, things like that. But the actual songs that are sung, the readings that are read, it's all all done by a consistory. Hmm. And so there's a lot of the the melding together of these two church orders to make a document called the Proposed Joint Church Order. I think it was probably more positively received from the Canadian Forum, though some of them had some issues with a few things in there, too. Than it was the URC, especially the American URCs is like, oh no, that forget that. Yeah, we we're not. That's not desirable to us at all. Right. There's there's a whole history of, and, and then when I er, earlier mentioned bureaucracy and and uh, quotas and those kind, they had a real sense we were governed top down. The boards, they were big mission board, home mission board, education uh, board of education. Like the the CRC had a, a good sized bureaucracy, mm-hmm. and the feeling people had is they run the show. Yeah. And so there's a, a, they've been vaccinated against that type of thing, you might almost say. Right? There's a kind of a resistance to, yeah. like, if you can't talk about quotas or assessments. You talk about askings. Mm. That's, that's the URC term. You have askings. And no church is really obliged, at least my sense is, no church is really obliged to, to do it. My sense was uh, synods can make decisions, but churches, whether that was officially true, but the sense I got was churches could kind of opt out. If we didn't want to do it, even the songbook is not an official songbook, right? It's not expected or it is expected, but not required, Mm -hmm. you know, whereas for us and for us, the songs and the worship service would be, I I, I think it, it goes back to a kind of maintaining doctrinal uniformity. I think that's why we have that. And one of the bones that I would pick with people, either CANRC or URC on this notion of top down hierarchy and so forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would want people to say, when a synod makes a decision, we have decided this, because that that in principle that's the reality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how we decide things. We come together, you know, and we decide it. But as soon as you start saying synod said this and synod said that, you get this sense of a of a body that's above you, somehow, yeah, yeah. telling you what to do. And there's a there's again a natural resistance, especially after the CRC experience. Calvin Seminary, the college was much more the the source of liberalism, but Calvin Seminary is seen as a, a huge problem. Had a lot of yeah, a lot of control in a certain way. When I when I entered the ministry, I had to spend one year at Calvin Seminary. Having spent four years in Hamilton, I still had to go one year to Calvin. That was called the ecclesiastical year. We call it the year of penance. <laughs> because you you sinned by you know attending the wrong seminary, so to speak. Yes. I grew up Christian Reformed. I went to a Reformed seminary, and they still said I had to go to the Christian Reformed seminary. 
And was that it a, was a power play, basically? Yeah. So how did that come about? Was that a synod uh, declaration? Previously, yeah. Oh, I see where you're going. At. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just yeah. yeah just they, curious. They yeah. agreed that that's what they would do because yeah. they did want to have control over who enters the ministry. Sure. I mean, we have a policy too that if, if you studied at a different seminary, you probably would have to go to, or at least that would be on the list of right. possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Reverend Fredericton Hill, I don't think he had to go. <clears throat> you know, he had studied at Mid America. Mm-hmm. received and accepted a call in the Canadian Reformed Churches. I think there was some interaction even in his case. I can't speak to the details. Right. I don't there know. Was. Yeah. There's still there's still examinations, right, that get done. He had yeah. classes and stuff. But even with the seminary. Right. Like, he, oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no. It's pretty public, but yeah. <laughs> he had serious. to follow up with the Canadian Reformed Seminary, I think, and yeah. Okay. I don't know if he had to take a course on Canadian Reformed History or something. Right. Um, so. That's, so it's not uncommon that this happens, but in, in certain cases, Reverend Bowers had the same thing, that they expected him, having been at Mid-America, to spend a year at Calvin. Well, Mid-America was within the Christian Reformed Church. There, there was no logic mm. to forcing him right, no. to become to understand the Christian Reformed Church by going to Calvin. This is a side issue. But, sure. right. but it, it's these kinds of things that create this resistance yeah. to a seminary, to quotas, to to all that type of mm. thing. So it was a seminary and it was um, a <clears throat> church order. What was the third one that you mentioned? Songbook. Songbook. That yeah. was, okay, the other. So leaving the CRC, which is viewed hierarchical by now these URC people, yeah. talking to the Canadian Forum, we're like, this sounds like the CRC again. Mm. Mm. Now all of a sudden this, there's the structure of, of hierarchy. Senate has to tell you these things. Yeah, right. Here's a better, leave it local. Let the consistory decide. Yeah. So for instance, not the, Pick on the Canadian format here, but right. um, women yeah. voting. Right. What a what a theological mess of synods flip flopping on this question according to who is delegated to synod and whatnot. Better option: mm-hmm. let the local church decide. Yeah, yep. you have officers in your local church, elders. Let them decide. Let the congregation vote on it. Maybe. Yeah. Yep. Um, at least the men of the congregation. <laughs> but for the URC, it's not. We, it's not viewed as a as a liberal trend. Women voting. We view view it as an advisory vote. It's not an exercise of authority. Yeah. It's not not an issue for us. Yeah. Right. Some um, of the OCRCs did not have women voting. There are uh, there are a couple yeah. of URCs that don't have women. Voting. Oh, I I don't know about but, but in the OCRC I remember that because they were at that synod or that mm-hmm. gathering when we decided to federate and there was some discussion. It was, mm-hmm. it was a bit comical. Um, you don't know the name of Yala Tuninga, but he was quite a character. And uh, he grew up in Nearlandia. His mother was Canadian Reformed. His father was Christian Reformed. And so uh, he had a kind of a split oh, so personality on the... Grew up on the fence. <laughs> the whole issue. Well, yeah. it was... Nearlandia was a tough place, I think. Uh, that was... Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it, it was in the Tuninga home. But okay, I remember him engaging these OCRC people. And, and Yala Tuninga was a very blunt guy. I loved the guy. But he he spoke very forcefully, very bluntly about women voting. That if you join us, we're not talking about that or whatever. You're going to have to drop that or something. Yeah, King yeah. James version, same kind of a deal. Yeah, yeah. Like mm-hmm. he that was Yala Tuninga. But okay, the point is, some of them, and and maybe some of those congregations still do, but they did not. In the CRC, women voting was a thing for a long time. We never connected it to women's ordination or anything, liberalism, anything like that. And the URC doesn't either. Yeah. Right. But yeah, we flip-flopped. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So because of because of what was perceived in the CRC, that there were actually a few, a few well-spoken men that kind of drove the CRC this way. Liberals that would be, always be delegated to Synod. Right. And the CRC Synod has maybe 200 people, 200 delegates at the Synod out of 800 churches. Right. The URC then, when they started, decided that every church will be represented by two delegates. Oh, wow. So the URC, with 130 churches at Synod, we have Synod next month, we'll have over 200 delegates there. Wow. So That's every a, church wants a voice. Is that a two Because they didn't really trust That's people in the CRC. That's mm-hmm. amazing. And so like- that that was a bit of a a growing process of learning how to trust each other. And I think in like 2007 mm-hmm. Synod, 2010 Synod, I think there was a lot of distrust in the URC among some. A lot of it divided on seminaries, um, whether you went to Mid-America Seminary or Westminster Seminary. Some perceived things coming out of Westminster Seminary. Um, so people started to draw this line. Just in, mm-hmm. But I think 
as big and seemingly unwieldy as a synod of 200 people is, what that has done for the URC is, is it has unified the URC. Because building relationships, sitting down face-to-face, -face, talking with somebody that you disagree with, mm -hmm. even your own federation, teaches you to love that person and mm -hmm. to respect right. their view, even if you disagree with it. Right. And I see a complete unity overall in the URC. Um, greater now, we haven't met for a couple of years because of COVID, but greater now than it has in my lifetime. Is there still uh, the classes, regional synod levels of, of the governance there? We have classes. Uh, our classes are a little bit bigger. We have eight classes. Okay. So these have like 18, 20 churches. And there's no regional synod. Okay. Well, because, uh, yeah, for uh, for the Canref, it's more like you're kind of bringing it to the the higher up assembly, I guess, to broader. Yeah. Broader, 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 broader assembly, higher. assembly, too. Be yeah. careful. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. a loaded term. The, the, yeah, can you inform your delegated broader, from, from the regional assembly. synod? To general synod. Right, but just to reduce the number of people almost who are who are speaking about it. But then So if you attended a URC synod and you attended a Canadian Forum Synod, it is a very different flavor of how things work. Interesting. The Canadian Forum Synod went two weeks plus, a couple days maybe? Or, I guess yeah, plus a day, whatever. Yeah. It was, so I was there, I was there about half the time as a URC yeah. fraternal delegate to the Canadian Forum Synod. I've been right. to their synod before. The URC Synod is four days long. That's unreal. Mm -hmm. You have to divide up work. You do it a different way, and don't don't speak if somebody's already said what you're going to say. Right. Oh, do you have something new to say? Okay, sit back down, type of thing. Right. Where it's like, no, actually, that guy said it. And that guy said the same thing. I'll say it again. Right. But if you have the time, if you have a small group, it's a totally different flavor. No. The Canadian the Forum Synod is much more able to be deliberative in their discussion on every single agenda issue, hmm. whereas the URC is going to divide these things up at Synod among their advisory committees but also gets the vote like if you're voting then you get the votes of every congregation mm -hmm. and not just it's not that the delegates would have to deliberate to to really you know make sure that what they're saying would be characteristic of the area that they're representing here yes or well, i think that's actually a, a kind of underlying difference between the two as well that that maybe the urc guys feel more like they are representatives Whereas the CANRC delegates are not sent by their home church. So mm -hmm. they're not answering to their home consistory. It's, right? They're yeah. sent by regional synod. It's almost like a House of Commons versus Senate sort of situation. Mm. Yeah. Like Silver second. Thought, <laughs> yeah. 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 So it, it is a different, you know, I remember the first time we, we were in Wyoming and there was a synod in Chatham, Canadian Reform Synod, and Reverend Zeckfeld and Reverend Vellinga and I attended that for an afternoon. And we were just amazed that these brothers were actually aimed at consensus, not at passing whatever the advisory committee thought should be passed. Hmm. My sense in URC synods, my own impulse as well, was that if the advisory committee, maybe, I, maybe it, it's not that way anymore, but was the advisory committee brought a report recommendations and then kind of fought for that on the floor that that's that was my impression um but in the in the canrc situation i'm not saying people don't have a, an opinion uh, and don't want to see their opinion you know enshrined <laughs> but uh certainly at that synod i got the sense they're listening to each other and the the committee representative would say we thought this and then the brothers they speak in rounds it's it it's a very orderly thing. And the committee rep would say, okay, we'll take that back and uh, we'll take that back and so forth. And they wait, they worked on it until they had consensus or at least a, mm. a strong majority of it all possible. Yeah. And uh, mm. I'm not sure that's, you know, maybe I'm misremembering or whatever, but that's my memory. And the URC was a different. I'd say that's fair. <clears throat> so how's, um, how's that work then? So you show up at the URC Senate, it's four days, there's like 200 plus people. You all meet in one room and then you divvy off to like go to your subcommittees and you come back again. So what they do is they take the agenda for Synod. Let's say it's 300 pages long. Sure. And they're going to divide that among 16 or 15 advisory committees. Right. They're already assigned that before they go to Synod. Right. Hmm. Maybe two weeks at a time, three weeks at a time. So okay. you can know your, you know your stuff really yeah. well. And so what happens that on day one, you, you vote for a chairman and vice chairman, et cetera. 
And then you, you go to your committees and that first day you do your committee work. These are the five overtures we have as a committee to deal with. Mm. We Are we going to, going to agree or disagree with this overture? Are we going to agree or disagree with the grounds of this overture? Okay, we're going to agree with it. Our recommendation to Senate is that we accept or accede to this overture. Right. Do those overtures come from the classes then or from? Overtures come from a classes. Yes. Okay. Originally, they have to come from a consistory. So there's a bit of vetting before they, like mm -hmm. the same as the canners you would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there's like a, a whole load of so, like. So it comes from a consistory. Then it has to pass classes. Okay. It's pushed on to synod. Right. Assuming it's an overture dealing with. And then this committee okay. deals with it to, to then be voted on. Mm -hmm. So they can come with their recommendation. We recommend that we accept this. And discussion takes place. And sometimes you can see in the discussion, they're not agreeing with us. They're bringing up things that we hadn't thought about. And then somebody's going to stand up and say, I, I move that we recommit this with right. this suggestion to them. So then they're going to have to meet again as a committee, come back with another short report recommendation <laughs> and go like that. So mm. then they have to work at night because it's only a four day synod. Yeah. It's efficient. Um, <laughs> it's, no, that's yeah. Good. And yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder if they, uh, the churches, the denominations swap their structures if we would come together right quick. Mm. <laughs> I, th I think for URC people, I mean, initially they even were talking about having one minister and two elders. You talk about suspicion. There was suspicion against the ministers because the ministers were the progressives in the mm -hmm. denomination, uh, many of them. And uh, it's in the CRC. In the CRC, yes. yes, yes. Sorry, I make that clear. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember at a classes in uh, in Alberta when Lethbridge decided to leave, that there was a, a discussion about having a retreat with the ministers would get together for two or three days at a camp or something, and they would talk things over. And I, when we were discussing, it, I said, "Well, I said the ministers got us into this." They're not going to get us out of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, but okay, so there was a, a level of suspicion. It didn't last long, and it became one minister, one elder, as the typical delegation to uh, broader assembly to the to the synod. But initially, there was talk about having two elders and one minister. That's interesting. So that, that the elders like... could outvote the ministers. Mm. Did I say that right? The elders could outvote the ministers. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I I don't know if I've ever heard of something like that in the the canarchy, or even like to people suggesting that maybe our you know seminary would be you know producing people of or uh, ministers of a certain sort or pushing an agenda like i don't even think that's at all alive hmm. like i've heard that from certain people but that would be more of a like uh i prefer the way the urc does it but that's like yeah right away if that's living in just anyone's mind then immediately you have a different yeah say distrust or, or but then it turns into something where yeah, more watchful eye, and then turns into more unity. I guess this the whole difference strikes me as more cultural. Like it's mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. the canarchy is British parliamentary. You know, deliberation, take your time. You know, do that. Of course, the American position is more of a just get fifty one percent and move on. No, I wouldn't characterize it that way. In fact, the rules of procedure, Robert's rules of procedure, I'd say, are more emphasized in the URC synods because they're they're big. Yeah, they're wieldy. Yeah, we have more. You're more likely to hear more complicated motions or amendments to yeah. motions, I find. But the um, suspicion of top-down authority. And nobody wants to pass something 51%. You want to unify your... Right. You want, you want to unify uh, the Federation. But like in this coming Senate, we have a report from our churches, which has a potential of being divisive. You also had a report coming to your churches, which also seemed to be potentially divisive to your Synod. It's got pushed back to the next synod. Yeah, they did uh, a lot. But of ours that. deals with missions and how we should run missions. It actually deals with the whole mission structure. Hmm. And there's a majority report and a minority report. That one will be hotly debated. And that's probably, that's by far the weightiest thing on our agenda. Hmm. Right. But when that's going on, you have to have a good chairman that can, can wield these things properly and mm -hmm. make sure that things, nobody speaks t more than twice and things like this. Right. Um, that we also have time limits on speeches. So, right. Interesting. So, okay. Five yeah, minutes. Kind of, it's kind yeah. of like a parliamentary committee that way. And how they do that. You get like time limits. It goes back. Sometimes to the green light, red light. Yeah. A lot, all, yeah. All, almost all the Presbyterians have that. Okay. They're very strict. Yeah. Really interesting. interesting. Presbyterians are usually by nature more parliamentarian too. Mm. But. Okay. Hmm. Do we want to dig into this report a bit that you brought just to get some, uh, some of the stats? Cause that's getting 
sure. uh, presented to this uh, to the synod. So I'll, I can introduce this briefly if you want. Yeah, so, sure. So kind of bringing this, we talked about the history now, but bring it forward now, where are we as churches? Before we talk about this, I think overall, especially in 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 most places in Canada, the relationship is excellent. Mm -hmm. We work together. Um, we have no problem transferring memberships to churches. If somebody moves to, if a Canadian Reformed person moves to Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, their minister is going to say, join the URC there. There's no, yep. um, we have joint projects. We have a joint project in London. We have a joint project with Streetlight in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. We have URC men at the Canadian Reformed Seminary. Education. A number have, right? Kids yep. go to Canadian Reformed schools. My kids are in Canadian Reformed schools. My daughter just started Guido. Yep. Um, thankful for Right, the faithfulness mm -hmm. of the Canadian form, and it's, it's, it's a good working together, and that's growing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think the way forward as federations is going to be not from what synods say; it's going to be an organic moving up to the point of listen, mm -hmm. we are already unified. Mm -hmm. It's just make it formal, change your name, yeah, you know, or something like that. So, right, yeah. The I, problem, you, yeah. No, you go ahead if you don't. Part of the problem that I think is holding us back more is that the majority of our churches are in the U.S. And they're just either not familiar with the Canary Informed or they've only heard bad caricatures mm -hmm. of the Canary Informed. Mm -hmm. right. um, they've had bad experiences with the Canary Informed. Um, the church in, in Grand Rapids did not have a good relationship with their neighboring URCs, like, like the American Reformed Church in Grand Rapids. It was not, not a healthy relationship. Mm. There's a little bit of that in Linden. Oh, it's a bit better than Linden than it is Grand Rapids. And so that's... Like, okay, if, if if all these Michigan churches, I think we have 14 churches in Michigan, West Michigan, all they know of the Canadian Reform is one particular congregation. And I'm not trying to pick on that church, but anyway, they had some, <laughs> issues, they had some issues back in the 90s. You can't deny that. Police were at church during worship services more than once. Anyway. Oh, wow. um, and it was, but if 14 churches only see that, be like, oh, those are what Canadian Reform people are like. Yeah. They view us as false. Um, they won't let our ministers preach over there. Right. Yeah, no thanks. Right. So mm, yeah. as a committee, we're trying to say, uh, no, that that was that church had some issues and moving past that. Maybe it was kind of the old Canary Reform view. Um, the pastor there was even in the Canary Reform circles on that end of things. Definitely. Like, so mm. I don't know the congregation at all. I just know the minister that was serving there. And he was a very uh, only true church kind of guy from my understanding. So, mm, okay. yeah. But and I was going to say too, you know, the the differences we talked about are cultural differences, not mm -hmm. confessional, not yeah, even yeah. really church polity. I mean, yeah, there are differences. I, I find it re remarkable, you know, in in the nation of Holland, a very tiny nation. You have, I think, eleven provinces or so, and they each have their dialect. It's fading a little bit because of you know uh, centralized broadcast, mm. but and and each province knows that the other province has that characteristic if you come from that province that's the kind of person you are and and so on and so forth right. yeah and and it's because they're so close to each other that the differences stand out the most right and i feel okay. the same way yeah. here yeah like if you would travel to ukraine or you would travel to you you name the country and you would meet another christian that would be the big thing you'd say oh a fellow christian yeah right but here we're so close to each other and we're so alike that what stands out for us are the differences right and and I think that's part of the problem too. Which seems and, to you, then you start fighting about the psalm book, which just seems so petty at the end, <laughs> you know. And and there's so so much misunderstanding, right. you know. Uh, being on the songbook committee, I regularly kind of had to assure my colleagues in the in the in the URC, these people are bona fide. They really want to work with you. They really, you know, and they're not trying to make you sing all Genevan tunes. That was not the no, you mm -hmm. know, but that was the the feeling that that was the agenda right and on a regular basis we'd have that discussion in our in our committee <laughs> right, right. and we got along very well as yeah. two committees and so forth like i yeah we had a we had great interaction and so forth but all i wanted to say is really when it comes down to it what are the differences they're small they they should be differences we can overcome really mm -hmm. and and how much flexibility can we build in how much how much variety can we allow? Yep. You know, um, yeah, I agree about the Federational Seminary, for example. When we were in Calgary already, we brought an overture asking that we establish in the URC uh, a seminary. But 
There was no uh, no bueno. no appetite for no. that one. We asked, could could we share the cost of synod altogether? In other words, kind of like a quota. We say this is how much synod costs yeah. for all the travel, all that stuff. Yeah. Let's pool that. Like let's contribute to that and divide it. No, they didn't want to do it. If if there are smaller churches that have a hard time, let them ask our deacons. Our deacons can help. So it's not diaconal. It's not the issue. Anyway, mm-hmm. it's cultural. That's why he's part of the it's cultural. Now, eh? No. <laughs> no I, I try to make that very clear when we left. That was not. Uh, <laughs> it was not that. So okay. anyway, sorry. So what? Back, yeah, what is this report. document? Yeah. yeah. So this this document is the report from our unity committee that's coming to our synod. And it kind of, the way that this works, our unity committee writes a report on every federation we have a relationship with. So in total, I think that's 20, 21 different federations. Wow. Half of them are international. We have, we have an official relationship with every church in Day Park. Wow. We'd recognize every church in Day Park as a true church. We have an official relationship with them. Some of the federations, OPC, Canadian Forum, we have a sister church relationship with, which is a second level. Right. So... This I just cut and pasted out this part of the report. And what it is, it explains where we are. What happened was in 2016, there was some pressure to move to the next step of the Canadian Forum. And people were getting very uneasy about it. And so what our committee proposed was let's take six years off, which is three of our synods. Our synods ordinarily meet every other year. Let's take six years off where we're not going to propose moving to the next step. We'll still work as committees. Uh, we meet together at Nate Park and we have these conversations. And the Canadian Forum Church has said, the ball's kind of in your court. We we want to move forward, but this it's got to be, it takes two two people, right? right. Mm-hmm. So the Canadian Forum said, the ball's in your court. So, okay, we're going to take six years off from proposing forward. So now, 2022, the six years is up. So now as a committee, we talk, where are we in this process? Where how, how can you find out? We have a representative from each classes on our unity committee. And so they can ask their classes, but they don't always know what's living in a lot of the congregations. Right. So what we did was we sent a survey out to all the all the URCs asking them, um, do you think we should move forward? Do you have any theological concerns with the Canadian Forum? Do you have any historical concerns? Do you have any church polity concerns with the Canadian Forum? Do mm-hmm. you think we should merge with a different federation, put more emphasis in a different federation? And then any other, any other comments. So as the secretary of the committee, I actually wrote that survey, sent it out to the churches, and then received the responses back. And um, the first question probably put a little bit of a cloud over the, the whole survey um, in the sense that it asked, you, should we propose to move forward to our next phase, which is process of unity? Right. And um, so some churches said yes. Some churches said no. And the majority said yes, but it was, um, I'm trying to think, it was like 30 to 25, something like that. The majority of Canadian churches said, said yes, the majority of U.S. churches said no, mm-hmm. which didn't surprise our committee. And so then, then the answer to the other questions, the reason why it's good to get these answers from these churches is because now we know what we can talk with with the Canadian Forum. Say, listen, some of our churches are concerned with these particular issues. Um, perceived hierarchy. Yeah. Came up. So for instance, um, if you look at the bottom of the second page, the question is, do you have any theological concerns regarding a potential union with the Canadian forum? 50 of the 58 churches that responded, um, said yes. Was it? Yeah. Um, eight, eight said, Oh, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry. Eight yeah. said yes. Yeah. Uh, 50 said no. So that's pretty good. Mm. It became clear. The issues with the Canadian forum are mostly, church polity it's your church mm-hmm. order but so right. but of these eight canadian form church's relationship with the federal vision we wrote a federal vision report as the urc mm-hmm. dealing with justification of the federal vision the canadian form has never made any statement about the federal vision whatsoever whether they're orthodox false and this is a this is a big issue in a lot of our churches so right. there have been some ministers that have spoken in favor of a lot of Can- federal vision tendencies and the federal vision view of the covenant is very similar to Skiller's view of the covenant. Right. So you're like, well, looks like a do- duck, walks like a duck, sounds <laughs> like a duck. Maybe, maybe they're harboring federal vision. Right. That could be completely false, but this is what people perceive. Right. Um, differences in guarding the Lord's table. 
we are a little bit looser on that. The container, if we don't have enough to bring to travel at a station, you can. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Nature of the covenant, fear of extra confessional binding are a couple other things. But I think that's that was minimal. Probably the bigger thing is on the next question, the church polity, um, a perceived can or see hierarchy. 28 churches out of 58 said they perceive the Canadian form to, to have a hierarchy. Hmm. I disagree. I disagree with that. I would be one that would argue against it. In fact, I could argue that the URC actually has a hierarchy more than the Canadian Forum. The Canadian Forum only has theological professors as their employees. We actually have a stated clerk of the URC. We elect him every synod. He is only paid, I don't know, four grand a year, but he's an employee of the URC. Each each classes has a stated clerk. That's a mm. continual position. Mm. Every three years, he's, he's reelected that position. And now the URC has a full-time paid uh, missions coordinator. Hmm. The Canadian Forum doesn't have any of those types of things. No. Right. Um, as soon as synod's done, it yeah. doesn't exist. And so, so the URC might say, well, the Canadian Forum has synod saying this to the churches. Nobody can say anything to the local church with some type of authority. But the URC also has church visitors, same as the Canadian Forum. They have some type of authority. They're right. sent by the classes with the authority to actually rebuke a church if a church is in the wrong. Hmm. Um, so in, it's the same principle. Yeah. Yeah. The Canadian Forum doesn't have higher assemblies. They have broader assemblies, just like the URC. So, I mean, identify that earlier. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting because we actually, when we did a, our episode with Art, uh, Art Witten about uh, our church order, mm. we had talked about this and we've been talking about arson a little bit. And if, I think if I ask any young person, how, like, do, does the Canref church have a hierarchy? They would say, no, 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 no. And then you say, how don't they? Because everything goes to synod and synod says what to do. And then no one can explain why it's not actually a top down model. They just know that it's not supposed to be. So they say no. But I don't I mean, I don't know. If that could be the same answer that a, that a younger person would give in the URC. But just the. Uh, yeah, it took a while to to get even art to explain it to me until I, until I got to understand that, you know, it's it's just representatives who are representing people. I guess it's a little more obvious with the synod. Mm -hmm. style in urc but yeah the the canarcy synod is is a delegated assembly and a deliberative assembly a, a urc synod is deliberative but and it probably would be called delegated but it's a bit more representative it, right. it is a difference um but in neither case i mean i i have concerns about permanent employees in certain positions that's part of my crc background mm. these people had a lot of power and um, <clears throat> the whole debate would be, you know, is there something wrong with the positions or the people who held the positions? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm I'm very reluctant to go in the direction of permanent employees, experts, boards, that kind of thing. Yeah. Partly because I also want to see local consistories taking initiatives and taking responsibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I very much like that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I mean, I can understand why people cannot um, articulate why you know uh, synodical decisions are not hierarchical or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that that's it. It's it's a perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's hard to overcome that perception. Yeah, right. Yeah. So are these uh, the things that you identified? Like, I mean, I guess they're not totally unexpected. Uh, the what the URC churches have identified with issues. Mm -hmm. with the canarcy are do you feel that they're encouraging or or something that could be moved forward with at this synod or is it going to be something that are are we back six years ago where everyone's gonna be like now nah, let's take another six years no i don't think these will not be dealt with at the synod oh, okay what the, what the reason why we're reporting this we have to report on our, on our work with every church right 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 you want to be have everything above the table you don't want you don't want people mistrusting your your own unity committee or something like that. Right. This is informing the churches. This is the result of the survey. Mm. And now what's going to happen is that our committee will have to sit down with the Canadian Forum Committee. We plan to do that in November. Okay. And we're going to have to work through these things. Say, so listen, we'll, we'll prioritize them. These are what we see as the top top three things. Explain to us how it's not hierarchy. Explain to us that you're not harboring federal vision. Right. In a number of these, right? I think. The, Many people on our committee have heard these things. The committee is always f further ahead than, than the churches right. are, right? Yeah. The, 
the committee just has to make sure they do a good job of taking the churches along with them. Right. As opposed to telling the churches what they should do. So yeah, right. if this goes back to Synod and, and your committee does a with along with the can ref committee go, does a good job um, explaining some of these things away. Does that, you see that having to go back to the churches to kind of diffuse the situation before it comes back to Synod for any kind of real unity discussion? I, I want to be very optimistic, <laughs> but you're like, by next, you, you can we'll become be... frustrated in the, the process. Right. There are, there are just a number of churches that they, they don't care, hmm. but we should be, you know, I don't care that we should, we're, we're not going, we're not going to, we have no desire to, why would we do that? Right. Some church down in wherever, Arizona, California. Right. Why would that matter? If we are, whatever we do with the Canadian form, you guys do it up there. Right. They'd be probably quicker to say, why don't the Canadian URCs leave mm-hmm. and join the Canadian form? Then they're happy. I was going to ask. And we'll just that. stay American. Is that, is that at all alive in the URC church? It's because been floated a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> because I see like here, like obviously we have really good relationships with the URCs in our area. But I would say like if there's that kind of want for unity here, is the same kind of unity alive from that local church to be unified with the URC in California? Mm. Or are they like, well, we actually feel more connected to, to the Canada yeah. here than we do. To- that's a very, that's very true. I've said that to many people. I said, I feel like I'm more connected, have more unity and probably am more like-minded with many Canadian reform churches around me than it would be with some of the URCs. Right. Um, I, I, I view all the, these URCs as true and faithful churches, but if you want to know my opinion on how practice should happen, I'd actually be much more Canadian form leaning than than some URCs right. that just have a different ethos. Yeah, yeah. They, they they're raised a different way. Right. We observe the Lord's Day differently. We you know, some of these things was like not necessarily right or wrong. There's a lot right, of right. liberty issues going on here, but yeah. I feel more comfortable here. Right. It's, it's a it's hmm. an interesting dynamic because earlier on we talked and and here uh, supervision of the Lord's table. One of my colleagues at the seminary, fellow students, pointed out to me that it was in 1978 that the CRC actually changed its policy for supervising the Lord's Supper. Up till that time, they had exactly the same thing the Canadian Reformed churches have. Hmm. Only sister churches, only with an attestation. And my point was only going to be to say, the study committee that they appointed was made up of almost all Canadian ministers. And one, he was he was living in Canada, but he was an American elder. He had come from Denver, Colorado, moved up to Calgary. And he wrote a minority report by himself. Hmm. And the Senate adopted the minority report, which I think, uh, that's my idea, that this is how he advocated what was being practiced in the States. Mm. You identify, you invite, you inform. Anyway, point is, you have that that difference already then, you know, uh, uh, of the American practice and the, and the Canadian practice. Hmm. And that might explain, to some extent, why in Canada it, it, it works better. Mm. Um, I, I'm curious about uh, how long ago was it that they had that symposium on uh, on the covenant? 2014. And, and that seemed to be reasonably well received and so forth. Yeah. So that was... Uh, that was the Federal Vision? Uh... No. Uh, see, uh, no, we didn't have advocates of Federal Vision in our churches. Like in the URC, there were some who who were in that right? A little bit in that stream or not necessarily within the URC? Oh, yeah, there were some. Okay. Yeah. And and we would say we didn't have, so we didn't deal with it in that direct way. We'd have been commenting on a phenomenon that's mm. that's out there mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the Reformed world, the Orthodox Reformed world, but not in our churches. Whether they would have taken it up in any case, I don't know. But um, I had actually uh, talked to representatives at Westminster and at Mid-America and at Hamilton to organize a symposium in in Niagara here, inviting professors uh, who were also ministers of these of the federations to talk about covenant, mm. and eventually it, it, there was one in Escondido, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, mm. and so uh, there were some URC professors and a couple of Can- uh, 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 Canarsie professors, and they talked about the different views. Yeah, it wasn't Escondido, but yeah, twenty fourteen, <clears throat> two professors from each. Um, Mm-hmm. to talk about this and um it was very positive 
And I think it, it did help the process forward because that, that would have been a number one on here. The Canadian form view of the covenant, right? They have the same view of the, as the federal vision on covenant. And yeah, I think I'm not sh I wonder how many Canadian reform people were happy with what was actually all said mm -hmm. there. So I have a feeling one of the Canadian reform professors was a bit more URC ish in his view than okay. Canadian reform in his view. Mm -hmm. and, but that made a lot of URC people feel like, oh, okay. But, Maybe they sent that guy because of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. But theoretically, and, and, and the URC would be similar in that regard. You'd have some diversity mm -hmm. of views when it comes right down to it. And the CanRC, like uh, uh, Schilder, uh, before the liberation, would say, I can live in the Federation with Kuiper, even though he and I have very different views of the covenant, or very, within the Reformed mm -hmm. spectrum, we're sure. different. Um, but I can live with that. There, there, there's this background of saying, we can tolerate theological divergencies. Right. And, and that, to me, is really the answer. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of the way we have to go with some of these things, that there's an acceptable range Mm -hmm. that we would judge as within the bounds of the confession and live with those differences. It's not easy. Not easy. That's why we have these different Reformed churches. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. a, a lot of times it's a view of the covenant, covenant status, these kinds of things, uh, you know, gotcha. create mm -hmm. the difficulties. Anyway. So yeah. if we were to work through like some next steps going forward, like let's say maybe the most, tangible practical realistic expectation would be that the canadian urcs could possibly join the canadian reformed what would that look like at a synod or committee level that what doesn't kind seem of work? like unity to me <laughs> what like, kind of work needs to get done i don't yeah i don't i don't know how much of an appetite there is for that frankly i don't no. think that's the answer well you're, no. you're gonna end up with the same amount of denominations <laughs> the quicker <laughs> answer not... And I've I've heard Reverend Wania's response to this, but the, the quicker response, which sounds very um, bully by the URC, was that since the since the URC church order is broader than the Canadian form, the Canadian form church order can fit within the URC church order. Is what I mean, right. you know what I mean? So more of the CanRC joins the URC. So the CanRC becomes URC. Gotcha. And the way that would work is that you would have to have to either introduce regional synods into the URC. Or um, have the seminary under the oversight of a classis, but it'd probably be regional synod north. Let's say regional synod Canada or something like that. Right. And regional synod south. Have the Canadian Reform Seminary <clears throat> under the authority of a regional synod, and therefore it still has church jurisdiction, still has professors appointed and overseen by um, a church ecclesiastical body. But hmm. that'd be the fastest way forward. That is creative. If you like did that, that, nothing would have to change in the life of a Canadian Reform church. You can sing oh. out of, you don't have to have Trinity Psalter Hymnal if you don't want. Right. Yeah. It's up to your, you can keep your book of praise. If we became Canadian form, we'd have to throw away our Trinity Psalter Hymnal, at least for corporate worship. Mm. And we'd have to sing out of the book of praise. We'd have to do this. We'd have to do that. There'd have to be more changes for URC to become Canadian form. Yeah, right. Whereas right. in the practice, I'd say there wouldn't be changes for the Canadian form to become URC. Right. The, the, the things that have to change are behind the scenes, like mm -hmm. the oversight of a seminary, yeah. which right. is big. How does you know superannuation work for ministers? Yeah, like, right, some of these right, things right. where it's like, yeah. But in the in your life, if that happened, nothing hmm. would have to particularly change. Right. We can. That's make the fastest way. Canadian Reformed Regional Synod and send two delegates to the URC Synod, hmm. and then it would be like, those would be the big men. Like, if you want, <laughs> if, if, if 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 I wanted to be kind of tricky in the situation, I could talk to Reverend Whining and say, "Tell me the five things I should be pushing to change in our church order that you might be able to accept it as Canadian form, <laughs> right. and I'll work on those for the next six years." Would you, but, but would you say it is more on the governance or the or the the synod level, or is it like what we were talking about before, like the just you know on the lay people kind of level where we're we do interact, like we have good unity, we you know, have people at our school, like URC kids are going to Canrough schools and, and, you know, hockey leagues and just marrying back and forth. And Lucas just goes there and no one thinks twice about it. And uh, except for a couple old URC guys in your church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like, is that, is that kind of the way that it's, you see it pushing forward? Yeah, or, organically or it's going well. And I think there's a continuing growing love. Right. And when there's that growing love, that that's what will push us forward. Be like, okay, um, we we can work with this. Right. We don't, we have a dis, we have a different view on this, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. I have a different view with my wife on a whole bunch of things, but you know yeah, what? We're, we're working it out. It's it's praise the Lord. Right? Um, yeah. You don't have to. Have, there has to, have to be uniformity of opinion. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, we have to have a 
uniformity of conviction in the scriptures. So it's about a bit of a, uh, immigration down to the south. Mm. Everyone have to send a couple Canadian people down to I've heard join that's, I've heard that's happening. Yeah, happening. Yeah. It's in, happening. Uh, in America. I, yeah. yeah um, on the songbook, uh, I, 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 I think that there would be room for flexibility on on having the Trinity Psalter hymnal as as an officially. It, it would not be easy, maybe, or or unanimous. But I think uh, Canadian Reformed people are, as a matter of fact, there were churches advocating that we adopt the whole book. Right? Uh, it came as as an overture from Regional Synod, which which means half of the churches theoretically were behind that you know yeah. that move uh, when we talked about a, a combined songbook the idea was yes 150 psalms but a uh, genevans but a collection of others as well it was not a you know it was not a uh, ours only kind of a thing um, mm. so there's there's flexibility on that um, yeah it's hard for me to say you know on on some of the other topics um, what flexibility would there be? What could there be? You know, there are certain convictions I would have certainly about uh, about polity and so forth that I, I'm very happy with Canadian Reformed broader assemblies and, and that kind of thing uh, in principle. <laughs> Not always right. in practice, but uh, in principle. And all of those things, yeah. <clears throat> I could be a Canadian Reformed minister. Mm -hmm. no, no problem. I would... Yeah. I wouldn't lose any sleep over that. No. <laughs> uh, I've been called to Canadian from churches and I've perfectly considered this, but I could, I could find myself there. Yeah. Um, and I think in time I might feel like I actually belong there a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, there, but I have no, no issue with that. There's nothing in our differences that I, that I find no. foundational that would, that would make us break unity. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I think guarding the Lord's table as well. It was interesting because that was of course a point of discussion when we were in, Wyoming, we met with the Kerwood Consistory. And I remember it was Reverend Van Woodenberg was the, the minister there. And I was wondering what they were going to say about it. And he basically said, look, we have a spectrum of ways of supervising the Lord's table. You go from open to closed, and there's a range in between. And neither one of us is, is uh, closed. Neither one of us is open. And we're both at different spots on that spectrum. And what the, what the URC is doing is acceptable. They, they said as a consistory. And mm -hmm. I think that would be a consensus. Whether they would want to adopt that practice in the Canadian Reformed churches, mm -hmm. but could they accept it? I think I think they probably could. Mm -hmm. and that's more, yeah. I guess that's more where it comes down with all these little things. But then you're accepting a... Um, it's tough to come to an agreement on what is the acceptable... Yeah, like where but, are we accepting from But then you, but then you come to an agreement right? of adopt our church order article. Right. If your if your church still wants to have people have travel attestations, you can do that with our church order article. Yeah. Right. It's your own local oversight. Right. Fence the table with these guidelines. Yeah. Yep. Make sure that this is a member confessing member that you right they're not under discipline, et cetera. You can still right. have that. Um, you can't have open, but you could have people have an interview a week ahead of time with the with the consistory if they want. You could have them have an interview fifteen minutes before the worship service. They're all of right. them, right? Um, so the Canadian Reformed practice across every Canadian Reformed church, is, I, I hear that there's some that are kind of getting divergent on their practice. They're all acceptable in the URC, according yeah. to our church order. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. yeah, We're running tight on time, probably, because yeah. we've been pushing an hour and a half. Do you get, uh, gentlemen, have any closing thoughts you want to give to this discussion? Maybe uh, Reverend Swetz and then Reverend Wani? Yeah, I think um, when, it, when you talk about church unity and the process of unity, there's a lot of issues to deal with a lot of a lot of facts, a lot of meetings. But I, I think at the very foundation of all unity is it is a, it has to be given by the Holy Spirit. And it can be frustrating because it takes time. I think we have to be patient in it and pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit will work in this way. We 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 can continue to encourage these things. You know, invite me to speak at conferences. We'll have your minister speak at our conferences. We'll have our youth go to conferences together. I'm, you know, I was at campfire this summer and all, all these types of things. The, mm -hmm. These all help the whole process. Organically, it's, I think it's going well in almost almost every place in Canada uh, where, where the two churches align. But I think it's it's something that the Lord has to give. And I think a lot of it is not on the, on the Canadian Forum. I think right. you have done your part. 
in a lot of ways, you're, you're still willing to do whatever we would ask in terms of organizing committees. If we asked some of your men, can you fly down to one of our U.S. classes? And come? I think you guys would do it. You, your yeah. heart is in it. And that is very encouraging to us. Mm. So I, I said this at, at your synod. I, was, I brought greetings. I said, be, just be patient with us. We are slower than you are. So yeah. but <laughs> we, we are in prayer and we have the same goal. And, and I think that, you know, that, that goes back to that ecumenical imperative. And, and, and Canadian Reformed people have been brought up with that mentality. Yeah. Uh, and, and I also, I, I guess I would want to say, let's not, let's not ignore or, or be blind to the unity we do have. Mm. You know, I, I realize there's a false dichotomy of spiritual unity and, and uh, organized unity, but we are one in so many ways. You know, uh, so I have hope in that regard and would love to see that happen. Um, but we, we are going to have to, uh, we, we want to look at that unity that we do have. I do think, too, that as time goes on, there is that um, organic, you know, back and forth uh, at, at personal levels. You know, when I went to the Canadian Reform Seminary, it was suggested to me, and, and somebody said, why don't you go to the Canadian Reform Seminary? I said, what's Canadian Reform? Right. I didn't even know what it was. That's 1982. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know. Yeah. We didn't have mm -hmm. contact. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what else to say. Just that that, that unity is there. I'd also, I, I do agree that we have to be careful going forward. As much as I would love to see it, I don't want to lose what we already have gained by, mm -hmm. by, pushing you know, too, too I fast. probably, I pushed too hard. I didn't realize it, but in my own congregation, previous congregation, I, you know, it, it was not wise in a certain way, but, uh, so you, if you push too hard, you're going to do damage. Mm. And, uh, but if you don't push, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Right? So you got to find that sweet spot between right. the two. Yeah. Yeah. Wisdom and prayer going yeah. forward. Well, this going has been forward. encouraging and definitely uh, you know, insightful. Yeah. <laughs> Did, didn't know uh, a lot of the stuff. So thank yeah. you for coming on, giving your time. Appreciate it. Really yeah, appreciate thanks for it. having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And yeah. Well, thanks for all your work on all these committees that you've been part of, mm -hmm. uh, unity committees and things like this. And yeah, definitely hope, important work. We hope this conversation can be helpful for uh, both our URC and CanRC listeners and, and anybody else for that mm -hmm. matter, too. So. Until the next time, yeah. uh, keep having real talk. Sounds okay. good. All right. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Real Talk. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen or watch the show. If you want to send us your feedback, and we'd love to hear it, please email us at reformedrealtalk at gmail.com. If you want to find us online or social media, we've got a lot of great content there. Just search Reformed Real Talk and we should come right up. This show is created and produced by myself, Lucas Holtfluer, and Tyler Vanderwood. And our wonderful podcast manager who does all the editing is Mariah Tamiga. So we're really thankful for her contribution to the show as well. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll catch you next time.